Okay, Miles Coverdale. Uh, several things I think are interesting concerning Miles Coverdale. Uh, he was ordained a priest in the Augustinian order in 1514. So he is a priest of the Catholic Church. Um, Let's see here. He left, uh, by 1520, he left the Augustinians and was preaching against Catholic dogma, such as transubstantiation, the worship of images, confession to the ear. Uh, he was exiled three times from England because of persecution. Uh, so he's exiled from England. He returned several times. He was persecuted, number eight, under Queen Mary. That'd be Bloody Mary. Uh, he, of course, at the first, he was under Henry VIII. But he was in prison for two and a half years at the beginning of Queen Mary's reign, several times examined before the Inquisitors, and somehow each time he's able to escape uh, from, you know, from being killed through the Inquisition. And remember we talked about this. If you escaped from, if you were taken into prison, about a 99% chance you're not coming out. And somehow he gets out several times. It's interesting, number seven, that uh, Catherine Parr, the final wife of Henry VIII, um, she was actually strongly influenced by Miles Coverdale and good chance that she was, I think, that she was saved. Uh, her and one of the other wives of Henry VIII, Anne Boleyn, uh, also was very much had, had come to realize the error of the Catholic Church. Anyway, so uh, he actually, Miles Coverdale, preached her funeral, uh, Catherine Parr. And then he was persecuted. Now, the only bad thing is number nine, only a real bad thing about Miles Coverdale. He was involved in a commission of judges that punished the Anabaptists. Uh, he was... Uh, you know, just I think, you know, I, I don't really mean to just cut him loose here and give him the benefit of the doubt. But it was very common for people to be burned at the stake. And so for them to take someone who disagreed with them, that's just kind of the acceptable thing was to persecute them. And so he was involved in uh, burning some Anabaptists. <laughs> Hard to cut somebody a uh, cut, cut them slack for something like that, but it sure seems to be the the order of the day at that time. The Coverdale Bible, his printing, it was the first entire printed English Bible. Okay, that's very significant about the Coverdale Bible. This is the first completed English Bible. All right, and there's a phrase that comes from that. Look on page 341. I want you to see these important principles, and I'm going to add this to uh, the list of uh, your, your page 371 list. Uh, you'll want to know this for the test. I figure I can at least do this. You know, I can give you questions on a page, and then I can add a few things to it. But I'll tell you what it is, okay? So that way you're not studying in Nicole James's words 200 pages trying to prepare for a test. So, <clears throat> and she was very uh, mean to me this morning on the way over. So she insinuated that my three-year-old could replace me. <laughs> she said it, but you know. She said, what, is she teaching our class today? I said, oh, you really think she can replace me, huh? Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. Look at the important principles that are contained in letter C on page 341. These are principles that Coverdale included in his translation. Now, these are very, very important principles to the study of the Bible. These are principles that we still teach in uh, probably in homiletics, or no, I'm sorry, in hermeneutics. Study of the Bible. I believe in these things. And these things that we're going to look at here, one through five, are very much against the Catholic Church okay, and their understanding of Scripture. Okay, how does a Catholic understand Scripture? I need a freshman. No, I need a sophomore to answer my question. <laughs> you are, you are, I guess. Anybody else a sophomore? Brenda? You're not, are you? 
Chris. You are. What is it? How does a, how does a Catholic understand the scripture? They mostly look to a lot of the early church father writings sometimes for interpretation or tradition. Okay, so tradition, church fathers, the the pope or the church, the church. So, so in other words, the individual isn't allowed to interpret Scripture as the Holy Spirit leads. Notice he didn't say the Holy Spirit, and he's very right on that. The Holy Spirit never leads them in, this, in the interpretation, which is the way it's supposed to work, by the way. Uh, I can interpret Scripture. I can tell you what I think it means, but ultimately the Holy Spirit interprets Scripture to each one of us. So anyway, number one, let's uh, see what, well actually let me read to you the phrase, uh, the paragraph that he included in his translation. He taught his readers some of the important principles of Bible interpretation. He wrote in one section of his Bible, But whosoever thou be that readest scripture, let the Holy Ghost be thy teacher, and let one text expound another unto thee, as for such dreams, visions, and dark sentences, what's that? Book of Revelation, prophecy. As be hid from thy understanding, commit them unto God and make no articles of them. Articles of religion. Don't base your foundation on hidden principles of the Bible. I think of the Seventh day at Venice. Uh, they have based a lot of their foundation, Seventh day at Venice and the. Um, um, uh, the Latter-day Saints movement, the, the, the return of Christ, the Millerites. I'm trying to remember all the names of these different groups. Um, they base their, their whole doctrine on the coming again, of the return of Jesus Christ. And they've got it down to these numbers, and this is how many years. And They're basing stuff off of prophecy, darkness, dark sentences, dreams, visions. He said, don't build your articles on those things. But let the plain text be thy guide, and the Spirit of God, which is the author thereof, shall lead thee in all truth. Very, very, very good, well worded. Let's look at these five things then that come straight out of that paragraph. First, the Bible can only rightly be interpreted by submission to the Holy Spirit. Miles Coverdale mentions this in his translation. Only the Holy Spirit can rightly interpret the Word of God. And that's very true. Number two, the Bible must be interpreted by comparing Scripture with Scripture. How does he put it? Let one text expound another. Okay, now there's some texts that are, that are very difficult to understand. So what do you have to do? You compare Scripture with Scripture. Is that what it's saying? Okay, um, I'm, I'm not thinking of examples off the top of my head because I didn't take the time to, I need to move on. But still, you need to compare Scripture with Scripture instead of building doctrine off of hard-to-be-understood verses. <clears throat> Third, difficult passages must not be interpreted in isolation, but must be interpreted by those that are clear. It is dangerous to build doctrine on difficult passages. Very, very true. The Bible student must not be discouraged because he cannot understand everything in Scripture. He must trust God with what he doesn't understand. Commit them unto God, he said, and make no articles of them. And then the last one, the Bible must be interpreted literally, and its plainest meaning must be allowed to rule. You follow the plainest understanding first. And everything else fits into place. Uh, I, I think of eternal security. The Bible is very, very clear, I think, on eternal security. But there are a few passages that seem to contradict. Work out your own salvation. Okay, uh, James chapter 2, chapter 3. Uh, faith without works is dead. There are a few passages that give some difficulty. But the plain understanding is eternal life. Literally, just look at it literally. How can eternal life be not eternal? If you have eternal life, you are saved forever. So those other passages must be made to fit the plain understanding. 
You understand that? And a proper Bible study I will almost, you know, especially with a little help sometimes, but a proper Bible study will always lead you to those conclusions. Okay, those five important principles on how to interpret uh, the Bible are very important by Miles Coverdale in his, in his uh, translation. Go to page 342, letter B. Coverdale introduced the Apocrypha. He had the Apocrypha in his translation. Anybody remember what the Apocrypha is? Somebody tell us. It's not in the King James Version, so and we don't believe it's the Word of God. Jonathan, tell us what it is. So basically, uh, it was written by Origen. They took a bunch of old mythology from Greek days, Roman days, and he uh, godified them, you could say, and then... Codified or yeah, <laughs> something. Yeah, you know, under, under Christ or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is all done in the name of Christ, but it's actually just sold mythology. Yes, so they're not true. They're based on myth. They're, they don't come from uh, ordained apostles or ordained prophets of God in, in any way. Nobody really knows where they came from, some of them. Um, so anyway, uh, he included it, but not deceptively like the Catholics did. The Catholics, in their, uh, in their Latin Vulgate, they, they split up, they, they, they spread out the Apocrypha throughout the Bible. You know, that's as deceptive as it gets. He put it in there with these words. Look at letter B. These books, good reader, which are called Apocrypha, are not judged among the doctors... The important people, you know, those who know the scriptures, they're not judged to be of like reputation with the other scripture. So yes, he included it, but he at least said, most learned men, which when you people say that, you know, if you believe that they're a part of scripture, you're a dummy, <laughs> is what they're saying. Most learned people say that these are not part of scripture. <clears throat> Okay, let's move on. Yes? Um, from what I was reading, the King, the King James also suffered from this, but again, the translators, they saw that and they're like, mm -hmm. this isn't real text. So they kept it separate like he did, mm -hmm. and they had every single page listed apocrypha. Mm -hmm. Yes. Eventually it was deleted. Very true. Okay, let's move on. The Matthew's Bible. We've got to keep moving. We're not going to get done today. Uh, I think. The Matthews Bible. John Rogers was actually the, uh, the author or the translator of this uh, version. Uh, it's thought to stand his, his a pen name, Thomas Matthew, was supposedly for the apostles, Thomas and Matthew. Uh, number two on page 343. For the Matthews Bible, Rogers used... Again, the Tyndale New Testament and those portions of the Old Testament that Tyndale completed. So he took all of Tyndale's uh, translating work. And then for the rest of the Old Testament, he revised the Coverdale. Some places, such as the opening chapters of Job, he made a fresh translation. So uh, this Bible was more intended for serious study. It included his works in the Bible, his study of the Bible. Um, now this isn't uncommon. This is not. This is, I don't believe this is against Scripture. They're not adding to the words of Scripture in that sense. Yes, it's in the same book, but they clearly designate that this is this is my commentary on the Bible. You know, it's not wrong for there to be a John R. Rice study Bible or a Schofield study Bible or you know however many others there are. I don't believe that that's wrong if it's clearly marked that this is not Scripture. This is a man's commentary on Scripture. So when you read those commentaries, don't take them as Scripture. You don't say, oh, is that what that means? <laughs> that's their interpretation of what that means. Right? Schofield, for example. Anybody remember any of the, the faults, uh, faulty beliefs of Schofield right from the very beginning of his... Trevor? Gap theory. The gap theory. He, he had fallen into the trap. He thought scientists knew what they were talking about, and so he accepted the, the common, popular scientific view of creation uh, of the gap theory. Um, what is it? <coughs> Do you know? What's the word for that? Deistic evolution? It's not de theistic evolution. There we go. Theistic evolution. Deist. 
don't know where I got that from, but. Okay, um, so anyway, that's, uh, he used, he put his together more as a serious study Bible. <clears throat> had an alphabetic concordance, um, had more than 2,000 marginal explanatory notes, many cross-references. Think about how difficult that would be. You know, when I cross-reference something now, I don't, I'm not the one writing the cross-reference. I use a cross-reference, and it's easy because my computer, boom, I just put a, name, a word in there, and it just, well, how would you like, man, I've, I know I've seen that phrase somewhere else. So you go back and you study, find, and you look and you look and you look. You ever, you ever gone without, maybe you didn't have a computer with you or a study Bible with you, and you're like, where is that phrase found elsewhere? I mean, you can look for a half an hour and not find it. It is very, very painful. Now, of course, they knew the Bible probably better than we did because we depend on a computer to find our, our phrases for us. They probably knew the Bible better. And so things, they, they knew where things were. They remembered more than we do. John Rogers, he followed his friend Tyndale into the flames, gave his life for his testimony for Christ. Read there the last paragraph in the bottom of 343. He had a large family time of his death, he had 10 or 11 children, including a nursing infant. His wife was a German. Uh, his request that, that his wife be allowed to visit him before his death was denied. He didn't see her or the children until on his way to the execution at Smithfield. Smithfield is a field uh, on the edge of the Thames River. It's the same exact spot that Tyndale was burned and a number of others. And so on his way to the execution, his wife brought the children to the execution to strengthen him against the ordeal. He wasn't allowed to stop and bid his family farewell. He calmly walked to the stake, repeating the 51st Psalm. He was offered a pardon if he would recant. And of course, he refused. When they saw him burning alive, the, the crowd rent the air with thunders of applause. And that wasn't glad that they weren't glad that he was dying. They were glad they were happy for the way that he died standing and not bowing to the Catholics. <clears throat> anyway, look, uh, read it later. Letter F. His, his wife uh, returned to Germany. And uh, several of their children became very much used of God in different locations. <clears throat> okay, let's move on. The Great Bible. This is just real quickly. Uh, Miles Coverdale oversaw the completion and printing of the first Great Bible. Now, the Great Bible is simply an edition of the Miles Coverdale Bible. Coverdale Bible was smaller. The Great Bible is called that because it was great in size. It was made specifically for uh, churches to be placed in churches. Big, huge Bible. They called it the Chain Bible, number six, and because copies were often chained to the reading desk at a church. Copies were placed in all of the churches of England upon royal authority. Thomas Cromwell ordered that a copy of the Great Bible should be placed in every parish church in England. Thus it came about that Tyndale's Bible was circulated extensively for many years in the name of others. Isn't that funny? Ironic as can be. The Coverdale Bible is about 75% William Tyndale's work. And they had him killed. And under a different name... The Tyndale Bible, most of, mostly, is, is being placed into the Church of England churches. I think it's interesting. <clears throat> All right, next, the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible. This Bible was uh, printed in 1557 and again in 1560. Uh, at least that's two of the editions. The Geneva Bible was produced by English refugees settling in Geneva to escape the persecutions of Bloody Mary in England. Okay, so this Bible was produced in Geneva by the English refugees. Let's see here. Go down to, uh, on page 346, look at number four. The 1560 Geneva 
edition was called the Breaches Bible because it said Adam and Eve made themselves breaches in Genesis 3, 7. All right. What does the Bible, what does the King James Version say that they made? Sorry? Aprons. Aprons, and God made them a robe, yes. So they said they made them breeches. <laughs> I don't think that Adam and Eve knew what breeches were. Um, anyway. The Geneva Bible was a milestone in many important ways. Now, there's several things that we'll see here uh, the rest of the way here in the Geneva Bible. Number five and underneath uh, that following. Uh, several very important firsts uh, as far as the, the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible is the first entire English Bible to contain verse divisions. It's the first entirely English Bible to contain verse divisions. Remember we mentioned Stephanus? Uh, that was the first Greek and Hebrew, the, the received text, the first, the first um, uh, in the original tongues to be divided into chapters and verses. And here we see the first English Bible to be divided completely into verse divisions and chapters. Um, let's see here. The first entire Bible in any language to contain verse divisions. For the first time in English, words not in the Greek but thought necessary to carry the meaning in English are printed in italics. So the first time in English. <clears throat> the Geneva Bible contains for the first time in English Bible the entire Old Testament translated from Hebrew. William Tyndale had completed Genesis through 2 Chronicles and Jonah. The rest of the Old Testament had been translated in the Coverdale Bible, in the Matthews Bible, in the Bishop's Bibles, which we're going to see next, from Latin rather than from Hebrew. So the Geneva Bible is the first English Bible to be translated entirely, for, or the first Old Testament to be translated into English from the Hebrew. That's a very significant first. Um, they were, it is clear, or it is now clear, exceptional Hebrew scholars. They were the first to use at first hand the Hebrew commentary of David Kimshi, followed in the, those readings in many places in the King James Version. In other words, the King James Version translators used a lot of the work that had been done here in the Geneva Bible. Okay, um, number six. You want to underline that last part of the, the paragraph there. The Geneva quickly became the most popular English Bible and wielded a powerful influence for about 100 years until the King James Version came along. The Geneva Bible was the Bible carried to America by the pilgrims and by the Puritans, the first settlers from England in the 17th century. Any questions on that? Geneva Bible. I, I love to see the steps leading up to the King James. Next is the Bishop's Bible. <clears throat> uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Matthew Parker, oversaw the production of the Bishop's Bible. It's called this because most of those who worked on it were Anglican bishops. The bishops wanted a Bible to compete with the popular Geneva Bible. And they wanted one that could replace the big one, the Great Bible. And the Bishop's Bible was never popular with the people. I wonder why. <laughs> uh, they knew where it came from. Okay, that brings us to the, the greatest masterpiece in history. Okay? Uh, been sold, uh, more copies of this masterpiece have been sold than any other book, and it's not even close. <laughs> okay, King James Version is an absolute masterpiece. Um, it was made, it was translated not just to be accurately translated, it was translated to be beautiful. Okay, and that's why American, some American universities, when they're studying uh, the middle-aged, uh, the high English, uh, they still study certain books of the uh, Old Testament, the book of Psalms and Proverbs. They still study some of those for their literary value. 
Okay, I'd love to tell you or read through every bit of this. There's, there's so many interesting things. I think we'll at least mention it here on page 348, where King James came from. You'll need to know that. Uh, he was James Stewart originally, um, King James the sixth of Scotland, and uh, he became the King of England in March of 1603 when Queen Elizabeth died. Who is Queen Elizabeth? One of the children of Henry VIII. We're still tied back to that guy. And when she died, they asked the King of Scotland to come be King James I of England. So he actually is an outsider coming into England, really. <clears throat> He and his wife, uh, his wife was from Denmark, and uh, they had eight children. Three lived beyond infancy. All the rest of them died. The other five died as infants. And the other three that live were all uh, famous people, <laughs> of course, right? They're the, the children of a king. Okay, so you'll need to know where he came from, how he got there. Okay, go to page 352. We're going to look at 352 and then uh, the spiritual climate for the translation. Once you also see the literary climate for the translation, we'll look at these two things. The King James Bible came out of a period of intense persecution and spiritual revival. Do those two go together? Often, right? Acts chapter 8, chapter 9. Uh, great revival takes place usually in the midst of persecution. Now, I, am, I do not like the thought of being persecuted. Uh, boy, you know, I keep reading these things and I don't know what I would do, you know. Uh, if I was being led out past my family and couldn't stop to say bye to them. Um, you know, then they give you the option. If you just say, I was wrong, you can go back to your family. And, and they said, I'll never turn back. I can't even comprehend that. But spiritual revival almost always is associated with intense persecution. Just He, he lists out here some of these uh, great persecutions. The Wycliffe Bible and the Lollards. There were laws passed against it. Its translator's bones were dug up after he died and burned. Hundreds of men and women who loved the Wycliffe Bible were imprisoned, tortured, and burned to death. The Tyndale Bible was persecuted. Thousands of copies were burned and destroyed. Laws passed against it, and eventually Tyndale was burned at the stake. The Matthews Bible, John Rogers, he was burned to, to death at the stake for his faith. Some of the translators of the Bishop's Bible had been persecuted for their faith by Queen Mary, Bloody Mary. The Geneva Bible was a product of persecution. The translators fled to Geneva from England. What if we had to leave our country? Put yourself in their shoes. There's a persecution in America, let's say, against Christians. And so we would have to go somewhere else. You know, by land. Uh, well, actually, they did cross the English Channel, so it wasn't all by land. But you go somewhere to a foreign country so you can have religious freedom. Go to Canada. But as a product of persecution, spiritual Bible produced by men who are in exile for their faith. These Bibles create a great spiritual awakening in England and beyond. Men accepted the Bible as the literal Word of God. Boy, we have completely lost that. I don't know if you realize, <clears throat> the 1800s, in, uh, in Europe and even here in America just destroyed people's faith in the Word of God. Destroyed it. Uh, you know, you have a hard time today convincing people that the Bible is the Word of God. Oh, the Bible's a good book. The Bible, Bible has a lot of good things to say in it. But most people, most Protestant denominations, as we see in our denominations class, they question, I mean, they don't just question, they deny the authority of the Word of God on the virgin birth and the resurrection of Christ and all the miracles that are found in the Bible. Now, all of that stuff is, if it's not in doubt, it's outright denied. 
Okay? So we live in a, in a worse, much worse time in, in a lot of ways than this, where people accepted that the Bible was real and literal and true. <clears throat> they had a passion about their religion were willing to pay any price for their faith, whether a turn on the rack, a fiery death, a dangerous journey across the seas, coming to America... Okay, 1611, King James, the Bible was translated. 1620, the pilgrims, well, actually around 1611 is, 1609 is when the pilgrims left and went to the Netherlands. And then from there to the New World. What was the deal? They want religious freedom. It's right in the middle of this. And by the way, we'll see, King James was not friendly towards uh, Anabaptists or towards uh, people who believed in the literal word of God. He was not friendly to them. <clears throat> so the spiritual climate for the translation was of persecution and it brought about revival. What's the literary climate for the translation? And I love, I love to see how God was working in preparing the world for the coming of a pure word. By the early 17th century, the English Bible had been developing for more than two centuries. Right? Tyndale, Matthews, Coverdale, uh, Geneva Bible. The wording of the King James Bible represents the labors of centuries of brilliant, believing, sacrificial, godly scholarships. Uh, scholarship. Dozens of some of the best biblical linguists who have ever lived applied their minds and their prayers to translating into English precisely what the Hebrew and Greek text mean. So there were a lot of people who were unbelievably involved in ancient languages and very, very intelligent concerning those things. Go to page 358. <clears throat> 358 starts a... This is the King James Version translators here. Some of them, most, many of them, I should say. And we're not going to look at every one of these, but I want you to see uh, what these men were like. So we said that they're the best biblical linguists who have ever lived... And all they wanted to do, their entire life purpose and goal, I'm sure, was to know these ancient languages and to translate. Do you, do you have a purpose like that? <laughs> I don't. I don't know of anybody else that does. Um, you know, maybe Dr. Waite. If you remember Dr. Waite. Uh, boy, he's re you know, that's his purpose and goal in life is the study of these ancient languages and, uh, and the scriptures and so on. Let me just mention to you several of these th uh, men here. I don't have time to go through them all, but Lancelot Andrews was one of the, uh, the main leaders. of. He was one of the leaders of one of the groups who did translating work. Uh, the translators were spit, split into several groups, and then, and then they would, once they translated a certain section of the Bible, they would pass it on to another group. And they would work their way through what had already been done. And, of course, a lot of that was William Tyndale's work. Look at what he was like. He was the master, master, not he, he was familiar with. He was a master of 15 languages. Once a year at Easter, he would spend one month with his parents. During that time, he would find a master from whom he learned some language to which he was before a stranger. During a month, he would have a master during his vacation. His Christmas vacation. A master would come in with, to his house and teach him for one month, and he learned a, a, an ancient language and mastered it. He acquired most of the, mo sorry, not all ancient languages. He acquired most of the modern languages of Europe. It was said that such was his skill in all languages, especially the Oriental, that had he been present at the confusion of tongues at Babel, he might have served as interpreter general. Okay? That's the type of person he was. Unbelievably intelligent. John Boys. 
Middle of page 359. He could read the entire Bible in Hebrew at age five. <laughs> My five-year-old had just started reading See, Spot, Run at five years old. <laughs> uh. Within six months of admission to St. John's College in Cambridge, the 14-year-old boys was writing letters in Greek to the master students and senior fellows of the school. It was a common practice with the young enthusiast to go to the university library at 4 o'clock in the morning and stay there till 8 o'clock in the evening. And he didn't have a computer to search around the internet on. He was studying languages. He was studying the Bible. Look at this. He was a Greek lecturer at St. John's College for 10 years, and during that time he voluntarily lectured in his own dorm room, in his own chamber, in his own office somewhere, at 4 o'clock in the morning, most of the fellows being in attendance voluntarily. This is extra. May be doubted whether the present day a teacher in class so zealous can be found at Old Cambridge, New Cambridge, or anywhere else. <laughs> uh, probably not. Even in his old age, he spent eight hours in daily study. He was a translator of the King James Version. <clears throat> On page uh, 361, John Reynolds. You'll see it pronounced Reynolds sometimes, or spelled that way. He had become a fellow of Corpus Christi at age 17 and a Greek lecturer at age 23. He was one of England's greatest champions for Protestantism. It is stated that his memory was little less than miraculous. He could readily turn to any material passage in every leaf, page, column, and paragraph of the numerous and voluminous works he had read. He would literally, when he read, he remembered where he had seen it. And if he could bring it up, he could say, oh yeah, I remember reading that on this page, and he'd go right to the page where he had read it. Wouldn't that be nice in a research project? You wouldn't have to write anything down. Yes? Um, we have someone like that in our church. Anything he's ever read, he can remember completely. I wish I was like that. Boy, that'd be, that'd be very nice. I remember things, but I'm always thinking, okay, where did I read that? Or where did I see that? Anybody else like me there? Oh, man. He was spoken of as a living library in a third university. And all of these are, are unbelievably smart and well-versed and sincere. Not every single one of them were sincere Christians, but they were all linguists, the best. <clears throat> okay, let's go back to where we were then. Page... Uh, 353. So the literary climate was the best translators, best biblical linguists that ever lived. That was the literary climate when the King James Version was being written. Secondly, the English language was at its apex. So the linguists were the best. The English language was at its best. Alexander McClure, historian, observed, the English language had passed through many and great changes and had at last reached the very height of its purity and strength. The Bible has ever since been the grand English classic. It is still the noblest monument of the power of the English speech. It is the pattern and standard of excellence therein. <clears throat> Um, 
All right, third. By the early 17th century, the third uh, thing about the literary climate is that uh, the, the knowledge of biblical languages was at its apex. Now, um, in some ways, this, this has been vastly improved upon by archaeology. But people who knew the ancient languages and understood them, um, in, in some senses, that's true that that was at its apex. But obviously, archaeology has opened up huge, huge uh, new worlds into the past, uh, especially with the, uh, the, the, the deciphering of uh, cuneiform and the Egyptian hieroglyphics and on and on and on. Uh, the ancient libraries that have been uncovered, that kind of thing has been improved upon uh, since that time, since the 17th century. <clears throat> Look at uh, page 354. Biblical scholars of that day, let be, grew up with Latin, Greek, and Hebrew and were as at home in these languages as in their mother tongue. One of them could read the Hebrew Bible at age five. In our day, scholars don't begin to learn the biblical tongues until their college days or later. <clears throat> okay. 355 begins now. Uh, a section on the translation process and, and how that actually, the, the workings out of the translation process uh, of the King James. Uh, we didn't look, we skipped over it, but um, on page 349 and 350 and 351, you want to read through that. Uh, that tells you how the, these bishops came to uh, King James and they said, look, we need a Bible that is completely accurate. Because they knew that certain parts of the Coverdale and especially the, the Geneva Bible, the Great Bible, uh, parts of those had been taken not from the originals. And they wanted a completed Bible taken from the originals. Okay, so... How, how do you do that? You know, it's how, how do you convince a heathen king that that's important? And for some reason, I say it's God, but for some reason, King James said, yeah, we need that. <laughs> I've always that's always struck me as just very odd that he he saw that as important. He wanted a completed English Bible. Which, of course, you know, in some ways, you know, he still has honor and glory from that because we call it the King James Version. But he wouldn't have known that. But he would have seen, I, I guess from a human perspective, he would have seen that this would be an honor to the English people and to the English language to have a completed Bible in English from the originals. So anyway, it tells you about the, the meetings and the conferences that they had and somehow God uh, convinced him. You know, I say somehow the heart of the king, right, is in the hand of the Lord. Uh, God convinced him and those bishops that were there who were all political. I mean, they, they weren't there to see the word of God advance. They were there for political purposes. And God convinced them that, uh, that they needed to go through with approving the King James Version. Okay, now page 355 tells you some of those rules, and I, I'm not going to go through all of those, but very specific rules about how it was supposed to be done. Look at uh, bottom of page 355, number one there. Here's just one example. If a special obscurity or difficulty was found, the companies were authorized to, quote, send to any learned in the land for his judgment in such a place. So when they translated and they passed their work on to the next group, if there were disagreements, they could consult outsiders. Other than the 54 who were assigned to this, they could consult outsiders to say, what do you think? You're an expert in the Arabic or the Aramaic or whatever language, the Chaldean language. You're an expert in it. What do you think this word means? And so they would ask, they could ask outsiders. That was one of the rules of the translation process. Um, 
Did William Tyndale do, you know, I think about this. William Tyndale was by himself translating. And that's good because he's translating to the English language, but he doesn't maybe comprehend all of the angles that a word might be used, all the tenses maybe or whatever. And so to have all of these men plus outsiders giving their expert opinion is it's infinitely better than William Tyndale, even though they ended up using it. And that shows to me again how how uh, miraculous it is that William Tyndale produced such a great version himself, all by himself. <clears throat> what time do we have here? Almost out. All right, and then there's a whole bunch of things about the translators. I already touched on that. Um, then the nature of the translation, page 363. It's a masterpiece of Bible translation. It conforms to the Hebrew and Greek. Its English language is peerless. It's been called the miracle of English prose. He has about 40 books, and by the way, we have a lot, we have a lot of these now in our library from him, that extol the excellence of the King James Bible. And look at some of those quotes there. Uh, Look at, uh, not now, because I don't have time to, but look on page 365, some questions about the King James. Hasn't it been updated in thousands of places? Yes. Yes. But most of it are spelling and printing errors that were corrected. Or, or not even errors. Spelling of the, the 1600s was different than the spellings of later years. So they changed the F to an S. And they changed the, the U to a V. So evil was spelled E-U-I-L in the original King James Version. Things like that. So have there been thousands of corrections? Yes, but they're not corrections in the words. Very few corrections in the actual words. The corrections came mostly in, in spelling or punctuation type things. Ease on the ends of lots of words and so on like that. What about the, the question, is it too antiqu antiquated and difficult to understand? Well, there have been all kinds of studies that have proven that to be a ridiculous argument. King James Version uses lots of simple words, one or two syllables. And then one other great question about the these and the thous on page 368. Uh, that will there will be a question about that on the test. It's not an it's not just because it was old English that they used the these and the thous and the yees. Okay, those were particularly put there by the translators so that they would clarify between the tenses of singular and plural. Is that tense right? Did I say that wrong? Anyway, I think I said that right. So it was to distinguish singular and plural. The, thou, thou usually being singular, usually. You and ye. Okay? Uh, if we, anyway, so I don't want to go into it because I don't have time to, to finish the thought. But All right, so very good questions there to answer uh, some very important questions about the King James Version. <clears throat> Now, obviously, this isn't a complete study. If you think this is a complete study, you, you, read, you need to read some books on it. Uh, there's a lot more to it than that, but uh, I challenge you to read through that.